Okay, so good morning, everybody. So my name is Valérie Vignard. I'm from the Ecole Polytechnique at Palaiso. So for those who don't know where Palaiso is, it's clo close to... You don't hear me? I can't hear you. Oh. Well, maybe it's by ears. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I try to do better. So uh, Palaiso is in the suburbs of, of Paris. And uh, I would like to thank the organizer, Benoit, Patricia, and Robert for inviting me and very happy to be, to be here. So uh, I will give a lecture on uh, nonlinear theoretical spectroscopy in condensed matter. So that's very unusual for me. Usually when I'm giving a lecture, uh, it's people who are very familiar with uh, condensed matter, so I have to explain what Chi2 is. Here I have the feeling that it's a bit different. You all know about Chi2, Chi3 and I will try to explain what we do in condensed matter and what are ab initio uh, calculation. So here is the, the outline. So I will start with an introduction and give some definition and general features. And then I will talk about the specificity of condensed matter and especially about the micro-macro connection, screening effects and excitonic effects, which can be uh, very, very large. And then uh, I will make a break. So if you have questions at that point. And then I will go with the ab initio calculation and several type of calculation that we can do in, in condensed matter. And uh, if I have time, some conclusion. Okay, so I will start with spectroscopy. What I'm usually doing is spectroscopy. So spectroscopy is a method used to study the properties of matter. And we investigate the matter with, through the interaction with particles. This particle, oops, sorry. This particle can be photons, can be electrons. So, and we, we record a spectrum. So we analyze the response of the sample to an external perturbation and this response is measured and plotted in terms of the frequency of the, of the energy of the, per, the, the perturbation. And it gives very important information on the elementary excitations that can have, we can have inside the matter. Usually, spectroscopies are uh, split into different kinds depending on the incident particle we have and the outgoing going particle. So, so in as an um, incoming particle, we can have photon, electron. Out, we can have electron and photon. So, for instance, the direct photo emission. We send a photon, we have an electron uh, as, uh, going out the sample. Inverse photo emission, so that's the reverse. We have an electron incoming, a photon outgoing. These two spectroscopies uh, are a uh, kind of excitation where we have a charge excitation. At the beginning, the sample is neutral. We emit or we absorb one electron, well, absorb an electron, we inject an electron in the matter, and so we have a charge system at the, at the end. We have neutral excitation. It means that we send, for instance, we send a photon we have a photon as an outgoing uh, particle. Or electron energy loss, the incoming particle is an electron, but it goes through the sample and lose energy, but it's a neutral excitation because the, the electron does not stay in matter. And uh, this kind of uh, uh, spectroscopy, the fact that we have a charged system at the end or a neutral system at the end means that the theoretical description of the process will be very different. So I will start by saying a few words about direct photo emission because this type of spectroscopy uh, is really devoted to linear processes because it's very difficult to go to beyond the, the linear. Uh. Okay, so photo emission spectroscopy, we have an incoming photon, an outgoing electron, the measured data are the following, the energy of the incoming photons, the kinetic energy of the outgoing electron, and sometimes also the angle of emission 
for the, for the electron. So what's going on? The perturbation, so the photon, induces a transition between an initial state that contains a large number of electrons, let's say n electron, and at the end, we have an excited state with n minus one electron. So the photoelectron spectrum looks like this. Uh, the important quantity in, in, in this expression is this A. It's called the spectral function, and it gives the probability to remove an electron. In a simple picture, this spectral function is just related to the density of the occupied states. So with this kind of spectroscopy, we have information of the density of occupied states not the conduction state, the valence state. And in the ideal case, well, by I ideal I mean the simplest case, this density of state is just a sum of delta functions corresponding to the energy of all the states in the N electron system. Uh, the real situation is that we have interacting electrons. And so the, the energy distribution is not anymore a sum of delta function. Why? Because when we, uh, when we have the outgoing electron, the electron leaves behind him a hole in the matter. And this hole induces a relaxation process in the system. So this excitation has a finite lifetime, so we don't have any more delta functions, but we have something which is a bit broader. But the hole itself is a perturbation in the system. So we have several excitation in, uh, as a collective excitation in the system, which means that at the end, we have several uh, additional peaks if we look at the spectrum. So this is a typical example. Uh, it's uh, an experiment uh, on silicon. So silicon is one of the simplest system for condensed matter. And this part of the spectrum is just the spectral function. It means that these delta peaks that are broadened. But then we have here a plasmon. It is a collective excitation of the electronic density that moves around the hole. So this is more or less, this, this peak here is roughly speaking this structure plus one plasmon energy. But we have a second plasmon energy. And if you go in that direction, you can have additional plasmon. So finally, this kind of spectroscopy is very difficult in the nonlinear regime, nonlinear in the sense interaction with photons, because we already don't know how many plasmon we have, how many transitions we have, so if we don't know also how many photons we have, we are almost dead. Uh, but well, things are slightly improving. Uh, the, these uh, two references are photo emission spectroscopy in, uh, using intense laser fields. But I have to admit that ab initio descriptions are far behind. Okay, so things are a bit different with neutral excitation. So if we if we take the process of photoabsorption, so the photons are absorbed by the system, the energy is used to excite an electron from an occupied state to an empty state, but it remains in the system. Okay, so I will be very fast on that kind of diagrams because you have seen them many times, so you can have also absorption of many photons Excit uh, the excitation that's important, the excitation of, the, of the, the electron can be a virtual state or real state. In case of harmonic generation, oh, the electron absorb energy, goes there, but this does not need to be a real state. It just falls back in the ground state. So how can we describe this? Uh, in fact, what we need is the propagation of the electric mag uh, magnetic wave in a dissipative media. So, the electric field is applied on a dielectric material. 
This is a, macro, a macroscopic electric. We will see later what's the difference between macroscopic and microscopic, but this is a macroscopic electric field. It will induce a dipole moment. And the, the, the key quantity in that case is the polarization of the medium that we plug in the Maxwell equation. So that's what we want to calculate. Uh, okay, so the polarization of the medium is split into two terms, the linear polarization and the nonlinear polarization. And the nonlinear polarization contains all the terms, um, second order, third order, and, and so on. Uh, it's very uh, useful to have a, a Fourier transform, not to work in space time, but in frequency space uh, through a Fourier transform. And uh, from this point, uh, we can analyze the nonlinear polarization in terms of frequencies. So we have the K2 here and all the, all the other processes that you know. Uh, okay, so that's the K1, K2, let's go. We have also the third harmonic generation, which is related to the K3. And we have also the, the, the two, uh, two photon absorption, which very surprisingly is related to the, to the K3. It's a two photon process, but the, the, the quantity that we have to calculate in principle is the K3. Okay, so now I'm going to say a few words about response function. So the, the very general definition of a response function is a localized disturbance is created by a, a, an external force, an external potential, uh, an electric field, in the neighborhood of a point R and at some time T. The response of the system is then measured later at some point R prime and later time T prime. And the, the response function gives you the relation between what was there at the initial time, an initial point, to later time at another point. So that's the response function of the system. So how do we calculate this type of thing? So we go in a quantum world, we have an Hamiltonian. H naught is the unperturbed Hamiltonian that describes the, the system before the interaction with the light. And we have the interaction Hamiltonian here. The Schrodinger equation in the interaction picture, so we have here only the interaction Hamiltonian. And what we do is we, we use perturbation theory. So we need the wave function, solution of this Schrodinger equation, and we expand it in terms of the perturbation. So the Earth's order, so that's just the unperturbed wave function that we, oh, guess what? <laughs> Stay here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I start again. <laughs> so this one is the unperturbed uh, wave function. So solution of the. Am I doing something wrong? Okay. Of the unperturbed Hamiltonian, we have the first order perturbation. So it's in an integral over the interaction Hamiltonian times the unperturbed wave function. Second order, so we have twice the interaction Hamiltonian on acting on the initial wave function. And we have to integrate uh, over time. And for causality, we always integrate for a time, uh, on times after the initial time. The, the um, causality means that you cannot have the effect before the cause. That's quite obvious to, to understand. Okay, so, and we can go to higher order. Uh, and what we need when we, when we have the, the wave function is always the expectation value of some operator. So it's defined like this. You have the, the, the average of the, op the, the operator into the, the, the wave function, so this one. And as soon as we have this perturbation expansion for the wave function, we can have uh, the, the same kind of expansion for the, uh, the expectation value of the operator. And that's the Kubo formula, which was uh, derived uh, quite a long time ago now. 
And the expectation value, in fact, can be ex uh, exponent in terms of commutators. Commutators of the operator and the interaction Hamiltonian. So that's the, the first order response. If you go to second order, so you have a commutator of a commutator. And you, you, if you go to higher type of processes, you have more and more nested commutators like this. Uh, th this kind of uh, expansion looks a bit strange. And you say, okay, what are we going to do with this uh, kind of nested commutator? But in fact, it's very simple to calculate because you insert inside some closer relation on the wave, uh, on the whole spectrum of the system, and you get some quantities that are not too difficult to, to evaluate. Okay, so which response function do we need? Our interaction Hamiltonian for an electromagnetic field, because that will be photons, so can be written in such a way. Uh, we have the scalar potential, and we have the vector potential, which, is, which are related to the, to the perturbation. There is a shortcut notation here. I always write one here. It's for R1, T1. It's the vector potential at some point sometime, so one. And uh, we can look, for instance, at the first order density. When we, when we have the light incoming on the sample, photons are absorbed, the density is perturbed, and we create an induced density that varies in space and in time. And the first order dens density depends, of course, on the vector potential and uh, the scalar potential. And you, you have this commutator coming from the Kubo formula. If we decide that it's more convenient to have the response function ex expressed like this, so we have the chi rho rho and the chi rho g. What does it mean? The chi rho rho, the, the first indice here means that we are looking at an induced density. So we, lo we are looking at the density, so we have the rho here, the rho here. The second indice means that this induced density comes from the scalar potential, so chi rho rho, the vector potential chi rho g. Uh, scalar is connected to density, vector is connected to current. So these are two response functions that we can, uh, that we have to calculate. In fact, to first order, we have four different response functions. We can look at the induced density, we can look at the induced current, and these can, this response can be created by the scalar potential or the vector potential. So we have the chi jg, so res the response to the vector potential for the induced current, jg. J rho, that's the same, but the perturbation is a scalar potential, and so on. In fact, uh, these four response functions are not independent. Uh, you know that we have a relation between A and V. We have gauge invariance. There is not a unique definition of the vector potential and the scalar potential. The only quantity that is completely defined is the electric field and the magnetic field. So due to uh, gauge invariance, we can define some relation be between the chi JG and the chi J rho, between the chi rho G and the chi rho rho. To second order, we have eight response functions. We can have response for the current, for the density, and they can be created by twice the, the, the scalar potential, twice the current, and you have all the mixing processes. So there are these eight response functions, but again, due to gauge invariance, they are not independent, and only some of them are needed 
to describe completely the, the, the process. Okay, so finally, what we have to do? We need the polarization. The polarization, in fact, the measured quantity is the susceptibility. But the polarization is closely linked to the induced current and the induced density. And they are give, given by the response function. So finally, if we measure the susceptibility, we calculate the response function. That's more or less the same. Now, we have another problem. We have different kind of fields. We have external field, we have induced field, we have total fields. The external field, that's very simple. That's the field that lives in vacuum, and that's what we apply. So we decide what is the external field. In the medium, we have induced density, induced current, they will create induced field. So we have induced field, and the sum of the external field and the induced field is the total field. And that's the total field, in fact, that will create the response in the material. But this induced and total field cannot be chosen as we want, because they are related to this induced quantity, which are not arbitrary. They just reflect the special electronic structure of the matter. So, Finally, a response function, but a response function to what? That's the next question. So we have an external potential. We apply it. We create an induced density, a time-induced density. This density will induce a total potential. So let me just... So we have this external potential. The external potential, we calculate an induced density, which is the response to this external potential. This induced density creates an induced potential. So finally, what is important is the total potential, the sum of the induced and this external. But then you say, hey, wait a minute. That's this uh, total potential that will create the response in the material. So this density is not the true one. We have to calculate the response of the system to that total potential. So we have a new density, which is different from this one. And this new density will create a new total potential. And you can go on forever. So that's what we call self-consistency. We have to calculate at the same time the induced, the, the induced density that creates the external, the, the, the induced potential that creates the induced density. And so we have a closed loop. So finally, we can define uh, two kinds of response function. One is uh, given by the variation of the induced density with respect to the total potential. That's what we call chi naught. Chi naught is a very uh, easy quantity to calculate because you just need the electronic structure of the material and you get directly the chi naught. We'll see that later. There is also uh, another response, the chi. This is the variation of the induced density with respect to the external potential. Uh, this one is much more difficult to calculate. And so finally, the self-consistency is either in V dot, the total potential, or in the chi function, because the induced density is a unique function. You, you decide how you calculate it, but there is only one induced density. And so if you use the chi-naught, you get it easily, 
the difficulty is in the evaluation of the total potential. Because if you know the chi naught and you don't know the total potential, you don't know the induced density, you don't know the susceptibility. So you can decide to have the other scheme. The external potential, this one you know. You choose it, in fact. <coughs> but all the self-consistency is hidden in this chi function. So you can choose whatever you like, one scheme or the other one. You have the self-consistency will, which will be somewhere. So this, this is written for linear response function. So it's only one photon absorption. But you have, uh, of course, uh, the chi, uh, the chi 2, chi not 2, which will be uh, the variation of the induced density to second order, and, and so on. OK, so what is the specificity of condensed matter? Uh, it's not exactly that this the process, I will tell you, appears only in condensed matter. You have them also in large molecules. I was not there on Sunday, so I could not listen to the talk of Isabel, but she's probably facing the same kind of problems. The specificity here is uh, in the way we solve the problem. And uh, I will stop a little bit on solid state physics, and I have a, a challenge here. I will try to show to show you solid state physics in two slides. So that's a, that's a challenge. <laughs> uh, in fact, it's not, so, it's not so complicated. I mean, uh, solid state physics is really a matter of language. I mean, we, ha we have our own language. We are not living in space. We are living in brilliant zone and all that kind of thing. So I will try to show you very, in a very short time what we do. And I will start with something that you know. That's the Fourier. If, you, if you're doing nonlinear optics, you're really used to Fourier transform. I mean, you have time and you have frequency. And you go, you switch from one world to the other by Fourier transform. In fact, uh, we do exactly the same for space. Uh, a crystalline solid is a system where atoms are organized and they're uh, what a strange sentence I have written here. So they form a periodic arrangement. There is one periodic, <laughs> it's a press one. Uh, and uh, so there is a periodicity. So there, in fact, the solid is characterized by a unit cell, something like this. It's a piece of space where you have the atoms at well-defined position. And you have also three vectors that are indicating how you have to shift the unit cell to reconstruct the whole space with a solid. So what we will do is use Fourier transform to go from space to momentum. And we have a, 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 an equivalence between these two spaces, exactly the same as we have we had between time and space. So the Brave lattice is there, and we have the Brillouin zone, which is there. We have three vectors that define how we have to shift the unit cell in space, and we have three vectors that are the reciprocal lattice vectors that explain how the quantity from the first Brillouin zone has have to be shifted to get the whole quantities. That's very rough. I think if people were giving le real lecture in solid state physics, if they listen to that, they will kill me. But. <laughs> OK, now we have the block theorem. It says that if on a system that is periodic with this uh, lattice vector, if you add one of these lattice vector for the, for the well, it's an orbital or wave function, you have a relation. You recover this, the, the, the same function with a phase vector. And this phase factor is uh, related to, to, the, to the wave vector. 
So this, the, the, the vector that we had by Fourier transforming uh, our space. And so finally, it means that every function that is living on a periodic space can be expressed in this way, this phase, a phase factor and a function that is periodic. Okay, so this one is not periodic due to this, but this one is periodic. So, so, and these functions are very useful to describe all the, the quantities that are living on our periodic structure. So finally, reciprocal space is very convenient, is very convenient for infinite periodic systems. In fact, it can be applied in other cases which are not really periodic, like uh, surfaces, wires, tubes. And this is done with the supercell approach, but that's, uh, that's another story. Okay, now we have microscopic and macroscopic fields. Macroscopic quantities are quantities that are slowly varying over the unit cell. It means that the wavelengths is much larger than the volume of the cell to the power one third to be okay with the dimension. So for, it, for instance, a typical external field, a typical macroscopic field, sorry, or external field, external vector potential, uh, scalar potential, but external scalar potential. And these are typical values. If you take silicon, the unit cell, the size of the unit cell is of the order of 0.5 nanometer. And if you compare it to uh, the uh, wavelengths of a laser of visible radiation, that's be between 400, let's say, and 800. So the wavelength of any visible radiation is much larger, but really much larger than the size, the primitive size of our material. So we can really say in that case that the variation of our external field is nothing at the level of the, of the cell. We have microscopic quantities. And for instance, total or and induced field are microscopic quantities. It means, in fact, that they are rapidly varying inside the cell. And this is because they include the contribution of all the electrons uh, in all region of the cell. And the response of the electron can be very different depending on the position inside the, the cell. And so if you look at the atomic scale, you have very large and very irregular fluctuations of this field. So what do we measure? In fact, the, 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 the quantities that we measure, are, they vary on a macroscopic scale. We are not able to detect fluctuations at the atomic uh, scale. And so in the long wavelength limit, the volume on which we measure something contains a lot of particles that will respond in a different way. And what we measure is an average of all this response of all the particles in the, 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 the place, in the, the area where, that we probe. So uh, and the, Unfortunately, what we calculate is a microscopic quantity because we really have access to the microscopic structure of the matter. So we need to, to average what we calculate over distances that are large compared to the cell diameter, uh, but small compared to the wavelengths of the external perturbation. And the difference between the microscopic fields, so the induced, the total fields, all, all these quantities, and the average macroscopic uh, fields are called the local fields. So how do we average? Suppose that we know how 
to calculate all the microscopic quantities. We will see later how, but for the moment, assume that you know that. So we are able to define the microscopic polarization to all orders and the microscopic susceptibilities to all orders. We know how to do that. So now, any function can be uh, represented by its Fourier series. So it's a sum, so we start with a function of space and frequency, and we expand it into a sum over k points, these famous k points. So function of k and the frequency, and this phase. Uh, in fact, uh, for infinite periodic crystals, instead of working with just with K, it's more convenient to split K into two parts. K will be the sum of two vectors, Q and G, here. Q is inside the first Brillouin zone. G are the reciprocal la uh, uh, lattice vector, so the, the one that we add to recover the periodicity in Fourier space. So it's, it's more convenient, so we, instead of summing over k, we sum over all q vectors inside the first Brillouin zone, and we sum over all g vectors, which are the reciprocal lattice vector. So this expansion can be written in a, a bit different way. So we, we want to average. So the, the, the simplest thing, for instance, is to average over a cell. That's the normal quantity that comes can, that, uh, come to our mind. But then which cell? If we just take this quantity, this quantity is not periodic. It could be periodic, but we are defining a very general method that have, has to work for any quantities. So we have a quantity that is not periodic, and we want to average. If we just choose one cell and decide to average over one cell, if we take another one, the result will, will be different. So we, can, we cannot just average this quantity. So we will transform a little bit this expansion. So we have The, the, the function that we want to average in space. So it's a sum of a Q, it's a sum of a G. The Fourier, compo the, the Fourier component and the phase factor, but we will split the phase factor. Okay. And now we take all the quantities that depend on G. So we keep this one and all the rest, so this sum, this one and this one, we call it Okay, so it depends. It does not depend on G anymore because the summation of a G has been performed. It depends on Q and it still depends on R because we have this factor. Okay, so we, we have defined this new quantity and if we, we know all this quantity, we can recover the sum. The, the good point with this new function here is that this one is periodic. Because when you have such an expansion, if the expansion is only of a G, it's a real periodic function. What breaks the periodicity in this expansion is the Q vector, so the one that are inside the Brillouin zone. So this new function, which has a component only on the G vector is periodic. And now if we average 
this quantity over any cell, we will get the same results. So this quantity is the true quantity that we can average to get a macroscopic quantity. It's not that at this point it is a macroscopic quantity. It still varies very rapidly on the unit cell because we have all these G components that makes the variation, but it is periodic. So now it's very easy. We take the quantity that we, we, we wanted to, de to define. So we average over a cell, any one, divide by the volume of the cell. And you know that when you integrate this exponential over the volume corresponding to the periodicity, the only integral that has a non-zero value is the one corresponding to g equals zero. The other one fluctuates, and when you integrate, you get zero. So finally, when you perform this integration, the only terms that have uh, a non-zero value is the one corresponding to g equals zero. So finally, it means that we have defined an average, uh, averaging procedure that corresponds to keeping only the g equal zero component in, your, in our expansion in Fourier space. It's called uh, the, the wave vector truncation. So it keeps all the vectors inside the Brillouin zone and throw away all the vectors outside the Brillouin zone. And so it gives us immediately a, a quantitative uh, interpretation of the macroscopic quantities. Macroscopic quantities have all their G components equ uh, equal to zero, except G equals zero. Uh, what does it mean? What, what are we doing exactly? Uh, we, we, what, what, what are the properties of this wave vector trun uh, truncation? In fact, uh, you can see it as the definition of two projectors. Every quantity has its average part and its fluctuating part. And so we consider the projectors that you take a function you apply PA, A for average, you get the average part. You apply PF, F for fluctuation, you get the fluctuating part. These two operators are in fact projectors. First, because PF is one minus PA. If you remove the average part, you get the fluctuating part. They have all kinds of properties. If you apply twice PA, I mean, you have a function, you average. If you average a second time, you do not change, okay? The same for the fluctuating part. And they commute. If you uh, take the average part, and if you take the fluctuating part of an average quantity, you get zero. Otherwise, we did not perform the averaging procedure correctly. But PA then PF or PF then PA is equal to zero. So that's just, it, it, it shows that these quantities are projectors. They have a second properties. Uh, PA, in fact, commute with the time and space differential operators. And that's very important because it means that if you take an electric field, an electric field is solution of the Maxwell equations. You average the electric field because the projector and time and space uh, commute, the time and space differentiation commute. It means that the average part of your initial electric field will also satisfy the Maxwell equation. And that's very nice for what we want to do. So the, microsco the microscopic 
part, so the induced and the total field, total electric field will satisfy some microscopic Maxwell equations. The macroscopic part of our electric field will also satisfy Maxwell equations, macroscopic Maxwell equations. Okay, and so for instance, if we look at the, micro at the microscopic dielectric tensor, uh, displacement can be written into a, an average part and a, micro a fluctuating part. Electric, the total electric field, and in between, we have the dielectric tensor, which can be written in terms of a matrix, AA, AF, FA, and FF. And so here we just uh, write the constitutive equation, displacement is equal to the dielectric tensor times the total electric field. And so what we want to do is to decouple the average part from the fluctuating part. The relationship that we are looking for is the relation between the average part of the, display, the, the electric displacement and the average part of the total electric field. And this will give us the macroscopic dielectric tensor. So we have to find the relation between the fluctuating part and the the, of the displacement vector and the electric field, remove them from this to get this relation. And we have to do the same to second order. We want the relation between the average second order polarization in terms of twice the average total electric field. And this gives us the macroscopic susceptibility. So what does it mean? The microscopic susceptibility gives us information on the screening of the interaction between the charged particle inside the system. The macroscopic susceptibility gives us some information of the, in, uh, the screening of the external perturbation when it goes through the, the matter. So that's the basic difference between this macroscopic and this microscopic susceptibilities. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite difficult, in fact, to get the average quantity. Uh, because the macroscopic external field creates the induced field, but the macroscopic procedure has to take into account that it is the microscopic field that induces the response that we will measure. So how do we do that? First step, we have to model our system in terms of an Hamiltonian. Then we have to calculate the microscopic response of the system, and we will see in a few minutes how we do that. And then we average our microscopic quantity. And so I will show you, that's the simplest example that we can take to, un to, to, to see what we are doing in an average in procedure. So it's the linear response to a perturbing potential. So it's the longitudinal case. We don't have any vector potential. And so all the electric fields can be uh, described in terms of, uh, of um, potential like this. So we have the longitudinal dielectric function, which is defined like this. So the external potential is related to the total potential through this dielectric function, and we integrate over space. So the, the microscopic dielectric function depends on two positions. We have the external potential at point R. We have the total potential at point R prime, and the relation depends on R and R prime. 
We can express this relation here, it was real space, so in reciprocal space, so we've transformed this. And so we get the external potential at Q plus G. Remember Q in the first Brillouin zone, G a reciprocal like this uh, vector. As, and it is a sum of a G prime. The total potential here is defined for G prime and we have our dielectric tensor, uh, dielectric function, sorry, for Q plus G, Q plus G prime. Now, the external potential is a macroscopic quantity. So the only component that is non-zero corresponds to G equals zero. So it can be written like this. V of Q plus G is just V of Q and delta of G zero. Unfortunately, it's not the case for the total potential, which is a microscopic quantity. So it depends on Q plus G for all G. We average this. So what do we do? The average of the external potential, we just take G equals zero. Anyway, that was the only non-zero component. And we have this. So we put G equals zero in this expression. So this becomes V of Q here. We still have the summation of a G prime, which is here. This dielectric function, we keep only one term because we have put G equals zero. So we have epsilon of Q, Q plus G prime here. And all these terms are non-zero. So here, there is a problem. We cannot go any further. We cannot say more because what we would like is, some, is a relation with only the term G equals zero for the total potential. And you know that the average of a product, of course, is not the product of the average. It does not work like this. So we cannot go further. So does it mean that we cannot have an average value for our dielectric tensor? No. We do it the other way. On this slide, we have the external potential in terms of the total potential. We can reverse this expression. We have the total potential in terms of the external potential. And here, it's just the inverse dielectric function. Which, are, which is defined, epsilon, epsilon minus one is a delta function. And now it's very easy to average because here we have only one term. The, the external potential is macroscopic. So if we take only one term here, this relation becomes like this. We kill the summation of a G prime so the total potential corresponding at, at Q plus G is epsilon minus one, depending on G, times the external potential. And now we can average because if we take the G component, the G equals zero component of this equation, we, get, we have directly this. So now we have the relation that we were looking for. We have the, the macroscopic value of the total potential in terms of the macroscopic value of the external potential. And the final result here is the macroscopic epsilon, and you probably have seen this uh, relation several times, and I always find it very strange when you look at it, because if you want the macroscopic dielectric function, you have to take the inverse of the dielectric function Average and take the inverse. You have to admit that it's not the simplest thing that you could think of. Mm -hmm. But that's the result of the averaging procedure. And you get always a strange uh, ex uh, expression for the average uh, value. Okay, so that was for the initial, the, the, the linear case, the electric tensor. Uh, you can do the same for the second order. I'm not going to tell you how because we will probably uh, be very late for lunch if we do that. I just give you the final result. So don't go too much into details. I just want you to, to, 
to have an idea of the results of our averaging procedure on the second order susceptibility. So this one is the macroscopic susceptibility. And it is defined of, uh, um, on, with the microscopic susceptibility, but there is no G vectors anymore. So we have taken our microscopic susceptibility, the chi, not the chi naught, average it, and we have three factors, one in front and two at the end. These factors, A, in fact, they depend on first order quantity. And in fact, this factor uh, uh, gives you the screening of the external field inside the matter. So what we get is the, the macroscopic second order susceptibility is the product of the average microscopic times three screening factor. This one corresponds to the incoming field. So we have two incoming fields, one at frequency omega one, one at frequency omega two. They are screened inside the, ma the, the matter. They produce the response, this one. And the outgoing field, the one at frequency omega one plus omega two, has also a screening that is the same term but the one appearing in the, for the incoming field. So it's, uh, all these quantities are uh, a bit difficult to calculate, but the idea is the following. You screen the incoming field, you screen the outgoing field, you average everything and you put, them, you put back everything together. And that's what you measure. Okay, uh, five minutes and we make a break. <laughs> So I will uh, say also a, f a, few, a few words on screening and excitonic effects, but uh, no equation anymore. So when we, when we want to calculate something, usually we start with band theory. Band theory is the, what, we, you, what you get when you take an electron, you put it in an external potential, which is periodic, and you solve the Schrodinger equation. You get energies that are discretized, and you have all the occupied states, we, we call them the valence states, which are occupied, and conduction states that are empty. So when we have an excitation, we promote, in a very simple picture, we promote an electron from a valence state to a conduction state. And that's what is called the independent particle approximation. So we have all our electrons sitting on their, in, in their valence band. They absorb photons. They go into a conduction state. But they do that independently on each other. It does not mean that they don't see them at the beginning. I mean, I don't tell you how we construct the band structure. We can put some many-body interaction in it. But one electron is doing a, a transition, another electron is doing another transition independently on, on the other. And if you do the calculation, in fact, what you get is the Fermi golden rule that you probably see in many textbooks. But it's not enough to describe what's going on in the, in the process. When, the electro, when the, the electron that was in the valence band is living, it's going somewhere, maybe outside the matter, maybe in some conduction state, anywhere. It leaves the hole behind. And finally, what you get is not an N electron system anymore, but a hole plus N minus one electrons. And this state will not stay like, will not stay like this, because the, 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 the main idea of all the other electrons, remember that we are in a solid, so we have a lot of electrons around this hole. All the other electrons will try to screen the hole. They don't want to leave it like this. And so finally, at the end, we have this hole, 
and all the other electrons have moved to compensate for this positive charge. The electron is carrying a negative charge, so you can see a hole as a particle that is carrying a positive charge. So finally, the energy that you put in your system has to create this situation and not this one. So it means that if you look at an absorption spectrum, the peaks that you see in the spectrum will be shifted compared to what you get from an independent particle approximation. So that's one point. And if you go back to the band structure, th this process is called screening. So if you go back to the band structure and you include the screening in the calculation of the band structure, what you see is that, that mainly the valence states do, do not move, but you shift towards higher energy the conduction bands. And in fact, it acts as an opening of the gap. The gap is the energy difference that you have between the valence states, the occupied states, and the unoccupied states. So the effect of the screening is that you increase the gap. We will see later how we do that. Now, the exciton. And uh, that will be the, the, the last thing be before the break. Uh, remember that we are dealing with neutral excitation. So the electron that have leave the, the valence band is staying inside the system. It's not going away as in a photoemission uh, experiment. So it goes there. And it remains there for a short, uh, a short time or some time, let's say. And it means that the electron which is now sitting there still interacts with the hole. And it creates an exciton. An exciton is just a positive and a negative charge linked together, a kind of small um, hydrogen atom. And they interact through the Coulomb potential. So what we, what we have to do is, as long as we do not care about the exciton, we can work with one particle picture. I mean, we have an electron in the system, we have a hole in the system, and they live their life peacefully. Now, if we really take the exciton into account, it is a two-particle picture. It means it's, for instance, a wave function that depends on the electron and on the hole. So here, we propagate in the system a one, one particle, here we have to propagate two particles that are interacting. I stop there. <laughs> so, ab initio calculations. And we will start with the full many body calculation, but we cannot go very far with this, uh, this uh, type of calculation. So, the first thing is what does it mean, ab initio? I mean, I've told you several times ab initio. So ab initio, it just comes from the Latin and more or less means from first principle. So it means, so that comes from Wikipedia, it means that it, it relies on basic and established laws of nature without additional assumptions or special models. It does not mean and I want to be very clear on that, that it's an exact result. I mean, we start with well-established laws. In this, for instance, equation, we can make approximations. But we know exactly the kind of approximation that we do. It does not rely on some additional parameters that we will choose to reproduce something. Okay, so the, we start with a, a Schrodinger equation and we make <coughs> approximation in the Schrodinger equation. But in principle, if we 
want to do an ab initio calculation, we shouldn't tune somewhere some parameters. That's what we do in principle. Don't go too far under the carpet because sometimes we have a few things that are not very clean. But in that's the principle of the ab initio calculation. So the full many-body calculation relies on two basic assumptions. The first one is we have a classical electromagnetic field. And the second one is that is the fact that the electronic motion is decoupled from the nuclei dynamics. That's the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So we are left with a uh, N interacting particles, electrons, submitted to an electromagnetic field. So we, the first thing we have to do is to solve the stationary states of the system. So we have the time-independent Schrodinger equation, this one. That's the kinetic term. The external potential or is in fact the electron nuclei interaction and the nuclei are fixed, they don't move. This is the Coulomb interaction between all the electrons and that's the full many body wave function. It's a huge object. Uh, you can imagine the number of electrons we have in the system for each system we have a position, so we, the, the, the wave function depends on the position of all the electrons for all the atoms in uh, the solid. So it's huge. But if we can solve the Schrodinger equation, we can insert some closer relation in the Kubo formula that I've shown you previously. And we have all the response function. This one is the linear uh, uh, response function. So you see that you have a sum of uh, all the, uh, the state of the system, all the excited states. Matrix elements. So A and B correspond either to the density operator or to the current operator, depending on which response function you want to calculate. So G, 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 O, and so on. And uh, it depends on the frequency, and we have a denominator, and the, the denominator will be almost zero when the frequency matches an energy difference in our system. So that gives you, for instance, the absorption spectrum. The same for the second order. We have some of a two uh, uh, excited states. We have three matrix elements. We have two denominators with all the energies of the system, all the frequencies, and, and so on. Uh, and all kind of permutation between all the frequencies. And okay, so if we knew the wave functions, we could calculate that. Unfortunately, we don't, because there is an enormous amount of degrees of freedom. So the direct solution of such an equation is usually not, for, for very small systems you can expect, I mean hydrogen, helium, lithium maybe, but it's, it's very difficult uh, to, to, to have a huge system. So the direct solution is not doable. And even if we could do this, could get the solution, it's also extremely difficult to store it. Uh, th there was a, a cartoon once, I couldn't find it, otherwise I would have shown you, showing the, the, the space occupied by floppy disk used to store as a function of the atom on which you store the wave function. So hydrogen, helium, you store it on a floppy. Lithium, you increase the number of floppy. If you have a macroscopic solid, if you put all the floppies next to each other, you have a kind of square 
And the square, if you put it on the map of France, it goes from Nice to Marseille. And it's a square. So it's a bit huge. OK, we don't use floppy anymore. <laughs> but even <laughs> on a key, it will be too much. OK, so what can we do? We have two strategies. The first one is to use model Hamiltonians. And then we get a simplified computational scheme. That's, for instance, tight binding. It's not an ab initio calculation. So if we really want to do an ab initio calculation, the only way is to be more clever. And we can use other theory, and it can be density functional theory, beta salpeter equation, or current density functional theory. And I will say a few words on each of them and show you some result. OK, DFT and TDDFT. So DFT is we start from the density. You forget about the wave function. Of course, if you have the wave function, you can calculate the density. You square the wave function. You integrate over all coordinates except one, and you get the density. But we have several theorems. Uh, the first ones are due to Ohrenberg and Kohn. And they say that any observable of the system uh, in an external potential are unique functional of the density. It means that in principle, as soon as you have the density of the system, you can evaluate any observable of the system. And especially, you can have the energy of the system. So the energy is defined as a functional of the density plus something that depends on the external potential. But this functional does not depend on the potential. It, mean, it means that once you have defined it, you can solve any situation. You just have to change the external potential. So you change, for instance, uh, the kind of nuclei you have in your system or whatever you want. So the density, de the, the functional depends on the density but not on the external potential. That's the first point. Then it says that the energy functional, so this quantity, has its minimum, which is the ground state energy, at the physical ground state density of the system. So if you have the true density of the interacting system, the energy will be minimum for this density. Unfortunately, at this point, this functional is unknown. That's the main problem. Then we have the Kuhn-Sham approach, the Kuhn-Sham equations. And it comes from the fact that each system of interacting particles in an external potential, so this, you have all the particles interacting with the, among themselves, can be mapped to a system of fictitious, so unreal particles, in an effective potential. It's called the Kuhn-Sham potential. And they have the same density and the same ground state uh, energy. So finally, what the Kuhn-Sham theorem say, that you have your system with interacting particles that you don't know how to solve because of this problem with the Schrodinger equation and the wave function. But what you can do is transform this system of interacting particles into a system of non-interacting particles. And so if you have a system of non-interacting particles, you don't have any more a wave function depending on all the coordinates, but you have just one electron orbital. So that's very important. That's something you can solve. And these non-interacting particles are living, moving, in a Kohn-Sham, what is called the Kohn-Sham potential. And so finally, what we have to solve is 
a Schrodinger equation, but this phi here are only one electron orbitals, depending on only one coordinate. So it's uh, equivalent to the one, part, one, one electron uh, Schrodinger equation, except that it's a self, so it's an eigenvalue problem, but it's a self-consistent eigenvalue problem. Why? Because the Kohn-Sham potential, the one that we have to include in our calculation that is supposed to reproduce uh, the, all the properties of the interacting system, depends on the density. And the density is built from the orbitals. The density of the system is the sum of the square of all the orbitals. So we have the density, we get the orbitals. From the orbitals, we built the density that we plug in and we cycle. Uh, then we, ha well, well then, before doing that, we have to choose the Kohn-Sham uh, potential. And that's where the problems are starting. Which potential do we take? In principle, it exists. It is unique, and so it should be fine. Except that this scheme does not give the recipe to find the, the potential. So we have to make some approximation, depending on the system we have, to find the good contram potential for our system. The only thing that we know, it, it is a functional of the density. In, for practical calculations, there are a lot of uh, Kohn-Sham potential. Uh, we have something which is called the exact exchange. We have LDA, we have GGA, we have hybrid functional. There's a, a whole zoology of Kohn-Sham potential, each of them working properly for some systems or other. You, you, in fact, you have to choose the good one for your system, the best one, let's say. What does it give us? It gives us, for instance, the band structure. And this is the band structure for the silicone. And here are plotted the results of two calculations with two different uh, Kohn-Sham potential. If you're a bit careful, you can get a good band structure because you see that the difference between the, the, the bands are not huge. One is the LDA. LDA relies on the free electron gas, and the other one is a hybrid functional, and uh, well, it's, it's not so bad. But it's not enough for our uh, optical properties. In fact, the density functional theory gives you properties of the ground state. If you perform uh, an excitation, it's not anymore a property of the ground state. It's a property of the excited state. And DFT does not give you uh, the excited state. And to, to get the excited state, we have to use the time-dependent density functional theory. If you remember the Schrodinger equation, you have the time-independent Schrodinger equation, and you have the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. For DFT, it's the same. You have DFT, you have time-dependent DFT. So it's an extension to the time domain of uh, DFT. DFT had the hohenbern kohn theorems. Here we have the runge gross theorems. DFT was based on the minimization of the energy functional. Here it's based on the stationary points of the action. But finally, what we have is a time-dependent kohn equation where you have this time-dependent orbital, and they depend on a Kohn-Sham time-dependent Hamiltonian. Okay, so it's like this. Uh, hidden here, there is a complication. The Kohn-Sham uh, potential for GFT was a functional of the density alone. Now we are in the time domain. So the time-dependent Kohn-Sham depends on the density, which depends on time. 
but it depends also on time directly. So we have here a function of the time dependence and density and time. So what the, the, the cone sham uh, looks like this. So we have the external potential. This one does not change. That's the nucleus plus electric field plus all the applied field. Uh, it's convenient to write it as, as the, the heart rate term. So it's just the classical Coulomb interaction among the particle, depending on the density. And here we have another term, the exchange correlation. Exchange, sometimes we know how to deal with. And correlation, we put everything we don't know, all the rest. And the first approximation we will make, and this is very important, is the adiabatic approximation. The cone sham potential will depends on the time-dependent density, but not explicitly on time. Why? Because we don't know how. So we have to suppress this time dependence because we don't know which time dependence we have to put. So it's still, the concham is still depending on time through the density, but not explicitly on time. And in fact, there are a lot of works actually going on this uh, adiabatic approximation. Okay, uh, I think I have to hurry a little bit. So uh, we know the density the response function are functional derivatives of uh, the density. So in principle, we are done. So we just have to calculate this. And uh, the, the response function, I don't want to go too much into details, are solution of uh, something that we call a Dyson equation. And here you see that the self-consistency is there again because we have the chi ho ho, the, that's one response <coughs> function. It's here and it's here. The chi naught is the response function that is just built with the concham orbitals. So we take this uh, awful formula that I gave you for the response function to second order and instead of inserting the full wave function, you just plug the, orbit, the concham orbital. So that's this one is known, and this one is the, the, the response function we want. So in fact, it looks like that. This, is, this one is a shortcut, but so it's a two-point equation, two integration of a space. So here and here, the response function. And we have also here, the Coulomb potential, and a kernel. The kernel is called the exchange correlation kernel, and it's just <coughs> the exchange correlation kernel, the one you had in the Coulomb equation, and it's the functional derivative with respect to the density. It means that if you don't know, if you don't have a good approximation for the exchange correlation potential, you don't get a good approximation for the exchange, exchange kernel. Uh, correlation kernel. The same for the second order. So it's a chi ho 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 function. It's a bit more complicated, but it has more or less the, the same structure. We still have the, the non-interacting response function, Coulomb potential, kernel, and of course, a new kernel that is the second derivative of the exchange correlation potential. So the scheme for, an, it's still an ab initio calculation. I mean, we just approximate the kernel. We don't have parameters. Hmm? So we do a ground state calculation in the framework of DFT. So here it relies on the choice of the exchange correlation potential. We built the independent particle susceptibility, chi naught. We solve the Dyson equation, so we have chi choice of kernels, and from this microscopic susceptibility, we build the macroscopic susceptibility. How does it go? Uh, 
this is a typical uh, example. That's gallium arsenide. So it has a cubic crystal, uh, crystalline structure. Only one uh, second order susceptibility is non-zero. That's the X, Y, Z component. And this is an experimental result that was obtained in 2003, which is extremely precise on a quite narrow range of uh, frequency. And so I will show you the, 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 theoretic, the theoretical results that we get, including step after step all the, the, um, the process that I have shown you. So first, independent particle approximation. So that's the formula I, I have shown you. And here, these matrix elements are just computed with Consham orbitals. And that's what we get. So here you can see the, the glass is half filled, half empty. If you're optimistic, you say, well, that's not bad. I more or less have the, I have the good order of magnitude. Not too bad. If you're not so optimistic, you say, well, yes, but the peaks are not at the correct position. So that's not too good. So it means that we have to go uh, a bit further. And so uh, we will have the screening. So the screening means that we will take into account that the hole that was created is screened by the other particle. Uh, this scheme, you have seen it. That's the Koncham scheme. In the Koncham scheme, we cannot introduce easily the screening. So we will use another scheme. And we will say, OK, when we have a particle inside the system, an electron, when it moves inside the system, it is surrounded by a cloud of positive charge that screen the, the effect of the other particle. And so we will go to this framework, or instead of having the interacting particle with the Coulomb interaction in between, the Coulomb interaction is a real problem. It's very strong. It has a long range. You can never suppress the Coulomb potential. You cannot apply perturbation schemes. So it's a real mess when you have the Coulomb potential. So here, we screen the interaction between the particle with a cloud of positive charge, and we have a quasi-particle. And because the, inter the Coulomb interaction is screened, we can use perturbation scheme to uh, solve this screening problem. So the intuitive pictures is this one. So you have the system. You have an, uh, it's difficult to see. So you have an electron that moves inside the system. And you have kind of uh, positive charge around. And so it's a, it's a particle that is dressed by all the other particles in the, in the system. So it's a, it's a quasi-particle. And we can write the quasi-particle equation. That's the equation uh, satisfied by this quasi-particle. So it looks like a Schrodinger equation, OK? We have the external, so the nuclei, the heart return, and instead of having this Koncham potential, the Koncham potential is local in space. Here, we have a non-local interaction, depending also on the uh, frequency. So this is a, a generalized eigenvalue problem. Usually, the eigenvalues are complex. The real part is the energy of the quasi of the, the quasi-particle. It's called the quasi-energy. And the imaginary part is the lif lifetime of this quasi-particle when, when she, the, the particle moves inside the system. And this strange ob the object here is the self it's called the self-energy. So his is, it's not an elephant. We don't have elephant in quasi-particle. We have horses. And that's uh, the, 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 the true system is you propagate a real particle. So that's the real horse. In the quasi-particle picture, you propagate something that is not exactly a horse, but looks like a horse. You can 
recognize here you have the nose and the tail. In between, it's a cloud. So that's the way uh, a, a, a horse is dressed to become a, a quasi-horse. Uh, okay, so we solve the, the, this quasi-particle uh, equation. Of course, oh, there's uh, something strange here. Uh, we, we need an expression for the self-energy. You can show uh, that a good approximation of the self-energy is the product of a Green's function. I will not go into detail. Multiplied by the screen Coulomb interaction. So the screen Coulomb interaction is the Coulomb interaction multiplied by the inverse of the dielectric functions. That's the screening. And this, because we, we some, uh, uh, some people have a lot of uh, fantasy, this approximation is called the GW approximation for, because it's the product of the G and the W. So, so we solve the equation and we just take the susceptibility and we replace here the energy, the quantum energy, by the quasi-particle energy. And we get this. It's better. It's better. It's much better, in fact. Uh, because now we have the peak at the correct position. Uh, it's a bit too small. So <laughs> now we will include the local fields. So uh, for the, uh, the cubic symmetry, it has a very simple expression. So the macroscopic here is just the, this chi rho rho. It's not the, 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 the non-interacting response function. It's coming from the Dyson equation. And it's multiplied by three dielectric function. And here, that's the blue curve. You see that, uh, well, it's not a real progress. First, the difference is very small. Second, it goes, it's the, it goes in the wrong direction. And this is extremely disappointing because it was very difficult to calculate this quantity. And when you, <laughs> when you see the results, it's, it's really, okay, well. So the, the last thing that we have not included is the exciton. So that's what we will do. So this is a, a special expression for Ah, it's a, it's a, uh, an approximation for the exciton that says, okay, I have the two charged particles. They interact through the Coulomb potential. So I have here the Coulomb potential, and I have a parameter that I have to choose. The first time this uh, kernel was built, uh, many people say, okay, now you don't have a initial calculation anymore because you have to tune this parameter. Later, we found a way to get exactly this parameter through an ab initial calculation. So it's not a, now a fitted parameter anymore. At the beginning it was, I have to admit. But now we know how to choose it without making too many approximations. And it's much better. Now we have the peaks, okay, the, the, the amplitude of the main peak. Uh, there are still some problems here. So we can, we don't know exactly how to solve, but we know where they're coming from. And uh, we have played a little bit uh, with this equation, with the kernel and, and so on. And just to, just to see, we have these uh, three dielectric functions that we, we, we can uh, calculate in the same, that we calculate in the same framework. But the red curve, which looks much better, in fact, is the result of here we put the experimental values of the dielectric function. That's dielectric function for uh, gallium arsenide, you can find it all, almost everywhere. So we just took the experimental values and replaced our theoretical value by the experimental value. And you see that it's much better here. And what's the difference between the theoretical value and the experimental value? It's the approximations that we have put in our calculation. 
and that still one approximation here that remains, it's the adiabatic approximation. We say that our exchange correlation kernel does not depend on time. If you transform that into a frequency uh, space, it means that it does not depend on the frequency. So we have a static kernel. That's the value of the kernel at omega equals zero. And probably this is very important for, um, for the calculation. And because we have three dielectric functions, the higher the process is, I mean, in terms of the perturbation, the most dramatic, the more dramatic is this approximation. So it's not too bad in the linear case. It's getting worse for second order, and it will probably be awful to third order. So that's one approximation. The second one, probably, is the fact that I told you that we have two kernels, the, the first derivative and the second derivative. In our calculation, the second derivative is just put equal to zero. And so that's probably the, the, this effect. OK. So do we have to do, to do better? Yes, obviously. This is a calculation on the, uh, some oxide, the strontium titanite, so strontium titan oxygen. And this is the absorption spectrum. The experiment is the black curve. The, um, lo the, the red curve corresponds to local field plus quasi-particle. And the green one is the exciton. And you see that none of these curves are able to describe the first part of the spectrum. The absorption, absorption edge is not reproduced, and that's, that's a real problem. And we can try any form of the exciton, we, will, we cannot reprodu reproduce this part of the spectrum. And this is due to the exciton. We don't have the good kernel for the exciton, and we don't know how to go further. So we have, for the moment, to give up with the density, DFT and TDDFT, and we have to use a formalism where the exciton is explicitly taken into account through a two-particle system. That's the Bethe-Salpeter equation. In fact, we have different kinds of excitons. We have the bound exciton and the continuum exciton. The bound exciton, you can find them with Frankel exciton, Vanier-Mott exciton. It means that we have a transition that is below the band gap. And so we, have, we introduce states in the gap that are excitonic states. And in that case, the band structure is modified and we have very strong excitonic effects. It's really comparable to the hydrogen atom. You have bound states and you have continuum states. The bound excitons, that's, all the, that's an exciton which is in a state that corresponds to the bound states of a an hydrogen picture. And we have the continuum exciton. It means that we have transition above the, the, the bound gap. And finally, we don't have a, a real modification of the band structure. We just have a redistribution of the different weights of the possible transition. And in that case, we have a weak excitonic effect. Gallium arsenide uh, be, uh, belongs to this kind. There, there is a, uh, an exciton, but it's a continuum exciton. In that case, TDDFT works. We get some approximate kernels. For bound exciton, that was the case of the titanate, uh, strontium titanate, it's a bound exciton, and we don't have any approximation for that kind of exciton. So we have the, the Bethe-Salpeter equation. It's the propagation of two particles. In the independent picture, we have the electron, that propagates, we have the hole that propagates, and they don't see each other. In the Bethe-Salpeter the, the equation, we describe the coupled propagation of the electron and the hole. So they don't move independently, they move together. So the, 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 
The function that we have to, to find is a four-point function because it depends on four points. We have the initial state where the, we have the electron, the exciton. So that's R1T1, R2T2. And we propagate those R3T3, or r 4T4. This is a, a, a polarizability. And the equation is the, the beta salpeter equation. It looks like that. So again, L0, non-interacting polarizability, V, Coulomb potential, W, screened Coulomb potential, and L is the uh, four points polar, uh, polarizability. Okay, that's enough for, the, for this one. And there's, there are two ways to, to, calcu to calculate this polarizability. The first one is you transform this beta salpeter equation into an eigenvalue problem. You need a lot of math, but uh, that can be done. You find the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions uh, of this uh, problem. And you use these new eigenvalues and new eigenfunctions to construct the susceptibility with the usual formula. And then you get the chi1, chi2, chi3, and so on. Nobody did it for the chi3, but uh, chi1 and chi2. The other possibility is to solve the beta salpeter equation in real time. It's a function that you can propagate, so you propagate in time. You make an excitation, propagate in time. You get the full polarization of the sample, full in, in the sense that you have all the orders, the linear term and all the nonlinear terms. You Fourier analyze it, and you get the, the susceptibilities. So if we compare TDDFT and beta salpeter, TDDFT is based on the density. beta salpeter equation is based, in fact, on Green's function. We have the response function, chi, which is a two-point function. Here we have a two-particle polariz uh, polarizability, which is a four-point function. In TDDFT, we move the density around. We have a density changing in time. Here, we move quasi-particle. TDDFT is extremely efficient. From the numerical point of view, it's extremely simple. Beta salpeter is very intuitive because TDDFT, you have to guess the exchange correlation potential. Beta salpeter, you know exactly what you put inside. So you, if you uh, want to use your physical intuition, it's extremely difficult to do it with the TDDFT. It's much simpler in the beta salpeter equation. Uh, how does it work? So that's uh, silicon carbide, second harmonic generation. So the chi x, y, z in, in terms of the energy of, the, of the, the, the photons. And these two, the, the full line are calculations that were done in the TDDFT scheme. And the dots are calculations done in the beta salpeter uh, scheme for different, uh, different uh, potential that they, they, there is. And uh, silicon carbide, that's a continuum exciton. So we see that in this example, if we have a continuum exciton, I told you that in principle we have good kernels, that's true. Because the beta salpeter equation does not rely on a kernel. So it's, we don't have to make any approximation. And it, the two calculation agrees. This is another result. It's a calculation done on the monolayer HBN. And uh, there is, in fact, so that's independent particle approximation. We include the screening, and that's the beta salpeter results. And we see here that we have strong excitonic peaks. And these peaks will not be reproduced by the, the, the TDDFT. I think I will skip this one. And I will just say a few words. This will be very short on time-dependent current density functional theory. 
GDDFT, we have potential, external potential. It's, and we use it to describe photons. And at that point, you could say, what kind of nonsense does she say for two hours? Now we describe photons that are transverse field with a potential. In principle, it's a vector potential. So from the beginning, I should not use GDDFT to describe photons. That's a problem. What I should do is use time-dependent uh, current density functional theory. It's not based on the density and on scalar potential. It's based on current and vector potential. Uh, it exists. We have a generalization of the runge gross theorem to uh, time-dependent field, vector fields. But if we compare um, TDDFT and the current, here we have a scalar potential, here we have a vector potential. If we have a scalar exchange correlation kernel, here it's a tensor. Here we have to make the adiabatic approximation. The current, with the current, it's probably possible to find ways to define non-adiabatic kernels. So there is hope that with the current, we get rid of this adiabatic approximation. But in the present situation, in the long wavelength limit, so for low frequency, optical frequencies, one can show that the longitudinal and the transverse formalism give the same result. It's, you can show it very easily on, in the independent particle approximation. It's just the gauge invariance that allows to compare the two results. Uh, if you want to go further than the, 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 the independent particle approximation, you can just understand hand waving. When you have the difference between a transverse field and a longitudinal field is in the propagation. So if we have We have an electric field. This field propagates. If it's a longitudinal field, the one that can be described through, with a potential, the propagation is along Q, and Q and the, and the electric field are parallel. If we have a transverse field, the one we have for photons, the propagation is perpendicular to the electric field. So they do not propagate in the same way. If we are in the long wavelength limit, it means that Q goes to zero. It means that there is no propagation. A field that does not propagate, that does not depend on time, that's what happens in the long wavelength limit, does not propagate. So this formalism relying on longitudinal fields and the one relying on transverse field in the long wavelength limit should give the same result. It's just that we are doing the calculation in a different way. But they are doing, they should provide the same quantity and the same values. So, hopefully, TDDFT can be used for photons as long as you are in the wavelength, long wavelength approximation. If you want to deal with some multiple expansion, you can have multiple expansion in TDDFT, but that's not what you measure. The, the quadrupole and all the higher orders in the multiple expansion are correctly obtained in TDCDFT. Uh, the problem with TDCDFT is that we have 
very few kernels, and especially for nonlinear calculation, they really fail for the moment. So that's, this is just uh, an example. It's uh, uh, time dependent. It's one of the first calculation in the nonlinear regime done with the current, and uh, it's a it's a dimmer that is submitted to a boost, and then we just look at the propagation. It's it's uh, there is no time dependent field after the boost, so in principle the energy should be conserved. That's what we get. Well, what they get actually. With the TDDFT, you see that the, the total energy is constant in time, but t the, the result of the TDCDFT is very bad. I mean, th there is some dissipation of the energy that goes in the system and is, the energy is not conserved. So this is obtained with the uh, Vignali cone functional for the current, but uh, obviously it's not, uh, it's not very good. Okay, so I just conclude. So if we want to go beyond the independent particle approximation for, get for condensed matter, we have the many body variational approaches. I did not talk about it, but it's quantum Monte Carlo, coupled clusters, that kind of approaches. They are extremely expensive in computer time, and you can deal with a few atoms, roughly. So then you have perturbative, perturbative approaches like Bete Salpeter. Perturbative means in the sense of the particle interaction, not in the field interaction. It's just the, the particle interaction. This is also expensive in computer time, but less than this one. And so uh, for an initial calculation, you can have a few tens of atoms quite easily. You can go to a few hundred if you are using a non ab initio scheme. And then you have an extension to mean field approaches. Mean field means that the particles are moving in an effective potential. So that's uh, TDDFT, TDCDFT. Uh, and they are very cheap. You can deal with a few hundred of atoms from the ab initio uh, point of view, but you need some approximation, and some of the available approximation can really fail in extended system. So there is a lot of work that is going uh, in, this, uh, in this case. And uh, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>